Hey, it's Aaron, metal theologian. All right, so it's time for part two of the deep purple thing. A little feature. And I actually think this might be the more interesting half because even though like the better albums are in the first half, it's sort of like when it, one album after another is just fucking fantastic. You know, when you're talking about all time classics like In Rock and Fireball, it's like, what are you going to say? You know what I mean? Whereas, you know, this shit might be a little bit more, uh, there'd be a little more variety as far as uh, my opinions on some of these. And I think a couple of uh, them might surprise you, unless you've been watching the channel for a long time. There's like this weird like light beam, but ah, uh, fuck it. It's a halo. All right, so I'm drinking this Colombiana. It's La Nuestra Colombiana. It's a cola flavored soda. And I feel like I might have had this before, but I'm not sure. But this is one of the other ones that I got at the uh, Mexican restaurant. I think next time Spencer in town, we're going to make a bucha recipe. But I think I uh, talked about that last time. So, anyway, we'll see how this is. Because uh, I'm curious, and I need to wet my whistle here anyway, right? Oh, Jesus, this is good, man. It's really, uh, it's a little bit syrupy, but also sort of like a seltzer -y edge to it, too, so it sort of balances that out. It's definitely really sweet. A little bit caramely. But yeah, it's funny, because it's cola with a K, but it doesn't taste anything like, you know, a Coca-Cola or something like that. I realize that, like, a cola nut is, like, a thing. I don't know exactly the relationship between that and, like, other shit, so... Uh, getting the cap, so I don't fucking step on it later. It kind of went off by itself. But I actually forgot something important. Uh, Alright. You know what's funny? I've been making videos for a couple of years, and I got this shirt, and, like, it's kind of cracking and shit. You know, it's like this weird, it's like this physical manifestation of age, you know what I mean? It's a shirt that, you know, admittedly I've kind of worn a lot. It's a comfortable shirt and, you know, happy to support Fantano, even though he kind of play in different leagues here, you know? But, um, yeah, it's funny to, like, see that. Anyway, whatever, man. Fucking, I'm not going to make a fucking existential crisis out of it or anything here. Trying to adjust this because it's making my hair look more gray than it really is, you know. And uh, I gotta cling to the uh, facade of youth here, right? To appeal to the fucking zoomers. Anyway, this is what we're listening to because we're not gonna play Deep Purple. This is Krillson. Yeah, I'm not gonna talk about him a lot because the video will be long enough otherwise. Anyway, but um, this is uh, I suppose a question of. of Final version of questionable legitimacy since it's originally just came out on CD. But uh, the band was from Alaska. And they're a little bit late for this kind of music, but uh I'm just pretty fucking fantastic. Yeah, they're from Wasilla actually too. That's the town that uh, Sarah Palin was mayor of, so anyway, um Alright, so we're kinda we, we went through the um sort of the first uh, through the Mark II era, so to speak. And um, so we're on to Mark III, and we're starting out with Burn, which is a pretty fantastic record. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and deny the obvious and start talking shit, you know? Um, if you want to nitpick this record, you can definitely start here in some of that shit that would make Stormbringer what Stormbringer is. You know what I mean? It's like... You can definitely hear the, like, Glenn Hughes, and I probably David Coverdale, too, but, like, they were really into that whole sort of soul thing with the, uh, you know, like, lay down, stay down. But, you know, you could say the same thing about a song like Mistreated, and that's actually a fucking great song. It's funny, when I first got this shit, I kind of thought it was crap. It was, like, this long-ass blues thing, and I was like, what the fuck, dude? But, like, as I got older, I came to appreciate it more, and I actually even, like, threw a Dio doing it on that Rainbow Live album. But um, it's a really good song, and yeah, it's really long and kind of drawn out, but all that music kind of belongs there. Burn is just a fucking incredible song. I mean, one of the heaviest fucking riffs ever. You know, it really... Um... Well, I suppose maybe we should speak to David Coverdale's vocals, you know. He definitely kind of had more sort of like a soul thing going on, even though he was, uh, you know, also from England. But, you know, you're sort of going for that and definitely kind of, you know, goes along with the joke that, uh, 
you know, British hard rock bands eventually go southern rock if they uh, don't split up first. And you can make that argument with uh, Deep Purple, but uh, when they were good, when they were doing that shit well, man, it was really good. And I think there's a lot of that in this record, you know. And uh, if you can handle that kind of sound, just that vocal style on top of a hard rocker like Burn, it's just a fucking thing of beauty, man. Because the fact is, Ian Gillen is a fucking... I mean, how can you follow Ian Gillen? You know what I mean? You fucking can't. So David Coverdale comes in doing his own thing, and it's kind of easy to shit on this stuff. But these records are really... At least this record is really great. You Fool No One is kind of... A little bit much of that sort of soul thing going on, but Sail Away is a banger. A200 is kind of a disposable little instrumental at the end, but... um. I don't know, man. You, you know, it's funny because probably half the songs on this record I didn't like when I first got this record back in, in the 80s. And, um... Actually, I was still living in Germany. I was probably like 14 years old or something like that. And me and all my friends were in a deep purple and all the record stores in Erlangen were sold out of this record. So my dad was going on like a mini business trip to Munich. I think it was Munich. It might have been Frankfurt or somewhere, but it wasn't like far. It was like a couple hours away. But you know, I asked if he could like stop in a record store and grab me a copy of this, uh, and he did. So I was like the first one in my little group who had the record. So it's funny looking back on those days anyway, because like, you know, it was there's sort of this like competition of the best record collection, and I mean, I guess I won. You know, I mean, I'm sitting here with five thousand records around me, but. I also still give a shit, you know, well into my 40s, and a lot of other people probably don't, so. Whatever, I know I'm not the only one, especially not with Jurgen around. Anyway, man, great record. Really weird back cover, actually. I think that's kind of underrated with, like, the candles of the band melting and shit, but um, if you haven't heard this, you need to, is kind of the bottom line, and I don't think that's a very controversial take, so. Um, it's probably not a very controversial take either if I say this is just a fucking piece of shit, this record. I think this is probably the worst Deep Purple record I own. And there are a couple that I don't own, and this would be worse than those too. Like, I kind of shit on the first couple Deep Purple records a little bit last time. I mean, I don't think I shit on them, shit on them. I talked about some of, you know, what was good about them, but I, I don't really like those records very much. This is worse, man. This record sucks. I think the song Stormbringer is really good. And I actually really like the song Soldier of Fortune. The very last song on here. And I pretty much think everything else in between is crap. I just listened to this the other day because before I made this video, I wanted to, you know, take it in again before I started really talking about what a nightmare of a shit record this was. I just wanted to go, you know, maybe there's something redeeming in there that I just fucking missed. And dude, I'll tell you, I just can't find it, man. And it's funny listening to this record, too, because I played this so much and I tried so hard to like it back in the day that I actually know this record pretty well. Now, I couldn't hum a few bars of Holy Man for you, you know, and if you played me two songs and said, okay, which one is Highball Shooter and which one is The Gypsy, I might not be able to tell you right offhand, but I would recognize both those songs right off, you know what I mean? But yeah, you can't do it right with the one you love, Lady Double Dealer. And especially Hold On, man. God, just one bad song after another, man. It makes me wonder what, like... Well, uh, actually, I was going to say it makes me wonder what the other guys who weren't, like, uh, Coverdale and Glenn Hughes were thinking at the time. But we know what Richie Blackmore was thinking because he left after this record, you know? What, he called it shoeshine music or something like that? And frankly, he's not really wrong, man. Because, uh, you know, some of that sort of, like, R&B type of shit that they were doing on this record, well... They did badly on this record, man. I mean, this really sounds like they were kind of trying to go Southern Rock. more. I mean, I think they were going for Soul, but it, it comes off more like sort of Southern Rock, and it's just kind of depressing, man. Yeah, this record really sucks. It's really bad. Like I said, there, there's one really good song on here. Two songs that I really like a lot, um, and you can get them both on compilations. Um, and speaking of, I don't know, this, this, this live record, it really kind of feels throwaway too. I mean, even the title, right? Like they did really well with Made in Japan, so they called it Made in Europe, you know? But like Made in Japan was a thing, you know what I mean? Like in the 70s and the 80s, like 
shit would say made in Japan on it, like your electronics, you get your fucking Sony shit, and it would say made in Japan. Made in Europe was never really comparable, you know what I mean? It's just a different thing, and you can't just like, it's sort of like, if you take that got milk thing, and like try to force every fucking thing into it, like got deep purple, or got fucking Colombiana cola, like it's not funny, you know what I mean? Like, once or twice you might pull off a witty one and that'll work, but like, it's dead after that. It's been so beaten to the ground that like, at this point in time you just fucking cringe when someone has that font and it says got with anything after it, right? Well that's how the title fucking Made in Europe comes off. And maybe the record isn't quite as bad as that, but like, really tiny there. It says interpolating rot me baby in the middle of mistreated, but guess what, it sucks, man. But overall, these performances are pretty solid, you know what I mean? And it's only five songs, uh, including Burn and Stormbringer, you know? You Fool No One is pretty rocking on here. Lady Double Dealer isn't even really that bad on this record, compared with the... I think it's probably better on this record than on the studio album, so... This is by no means a great record, and is really kind of not required listening, you know, not an essential entry into your fucking uh, Deep Purple collection. But it's not terrible, you know what I mean? If you're interested in a little artifact of what they sort of sound like mid-period of David Coverdale, I suppose that's what you've got, you know? I'm sure there are other ones out there because there are so many Deep Purple live records. That is really good. Not as good as that banana one from a couple videos ago, but it's pretty fucking good. Anyway, if that's what you're after, that's it. Uh, we have another live album that we're going to like be talking about with uh, more uh, relish. Um, okay, so this one might surprise you. Right now is a section of the video where you need to forget that this is a Deep Purple video, okay? Because if you judge this record by the standards of Deep Purple, if you try to compare this to Deep Purple and Rock, it's really not that great. But if you listen to this as just like a fucking 70s, like hard rock record, like sort of, you know, what is it, 75, 76, 75, yeah. If instead of comparing this to Deep Purple, if you compare this to bands like Bull Angus, um, maybe, I don't know, I'm thinking of Buffalo, maybe Buffalo is a little bit too heavy a hitter to compare. Although Buffalo made some kind of weak sauce in their time too, you know. Anyway, by that standard, this is actually a really cool record, and I think it's kind of a gem, you know? The bad songs on this thing, and, and there are a few, the only one that really kind of annoys me is that Ode to G instrumental, because that just bugs me so much. And my God, this fucking cover. Jesus Christ, so bad, you know? Yeah, and the, and the gatefold's all lame, too. This is almost like they've stepped far enough away with Tommy Bolin joining the band now, right? It's like they almost stepped far enough away from the Deep Purple sound that they're just sort of free to just sort of be a regular hard rock band, you know what I mean? As opposed to gods, you know what I mean? And there's some real fucking bangers on here, man. Like, Love Child is a fantastic song. One of my favorite songs from the Coverdale era, easily, you know? Drifter is cool. You Keep On Moving is kind of, you know, another one of their little soul things. Like, Glenn Hughes is really kind of... If you're going to, like, hate Glenn Hughes, You Keep On Moving is a good song to hate on Glenn Hughes for. But I fucking love it, man. I really do, you know? And uh, Getting Tighter is kind of throwaway, but Dealer is good, and Lady Luck is a, you know, is a nice rocker and shit. Overall, man, I think this is a really fun record. Um, I have been known in the past to say that this is the best of the Coverdale era records. I don't think I really believe that. I think Burn edges it out, but a big part of that is because just the song Burn puts a thumb so heavily on the scale that even though Love Child is pretty fucking close, it doesn't quite come up to that level, you know? So, um, overall, an underrated record, and one that is, especially even though it's not very expensive, or at least it wasn't last time I was in the market for one, um, yeah, I don't remember when I got this, but I was in the States again, but I probably wasn't 20 yet, so, you know, I've had this a long time. So don't necessarily take my word for it on the price, but it's a really good record. At least listen to it online or something like that. And 
don't expect it to sound like you, if you're wanting to hear that intro to Fireball, listen to Fireball. Don't listen to this. But if you want to hear like a banger, this is a banger, dude. It's a good fucking record. Okay, so another thing I want to do in this video is we're talking about this era and we're going to talk about some of the reunion ones. I'll tell you right now, the most recent one I have, the last one I have is House of Blue Light. But the other ones that we're going to talk about here a little bit are some of these uh, compilations, okay? So this is Powerhouse, which is uh, <laughs> includes a collection. It's funny, like, in, like includes how, like, on the record that, like, you're buying it for. Well, maybe includes it with the cover. Buy this jacket, and it includes a record, which is a collection of previously unreleased live and studio tracks from the Halcyon days of Deep Purple, featuring, and of course it names them, right? Probably the most notable thing about this is that it has, um, they did a regular set, like a short set before that concerto performance that they did, the concerto for group and orchestra. They did three songs, and those are actually all here. You know, I, I should check which ones they were. Um, it also has the version of Black Knight that um, that 12-year-old me first heard on 24 Karat Purple. I think these songs, by the way, are Hush, Ring That Neck, and Child in Time. This has a super early version of Child in Time. It has super early performance of Hush with Ian Gillen. And then it has a couple things that are like B-sides. Yeah, Painted Horse... Which isn't great, but it's okay. Uh, Cry Free is pretty fucking great, though. And, and I wouldn't want to shit on Painted Horse, either. Ring That Neck, though, is also interesting, too. It sort of makes an appearance here as um, one of the songs from, like, the early days that kind of hung around. And, um, I don't know. I, it Actually, I, I just saw a note on the back of there where it says how they sort of were easing that shit out of the catalog as they, um, you know, started writing more shit with the new band. But, um... I, I, I don't know. I think that song works pretty well in um, a live set. It's, you know, maybe sort of semi-filler. But, you know, how many more times you need to hear, uh, you know, Highway Star if we're on that topic? You know what I mean? Given that every one of these fucking records is going to have Highway Star and Strange Kind of Woman and Lazy and Space Truck in. It's like, you know, I kind of don't mind having Ring That Neck in there to mix it up a little bit. So I'm actually going to switch these two around for just that reason, because this one is actually a Deep Purple in concert. This one actually came out after the one that I was about to show, but we're going to do the sort of consistency of narrative. This is not as good as Made in Japan. The performances aren't quite as hot. And it definitely feels more meandering, because this record is really long. Every song on here fucking... I mean, there are two songs per side, except on side three, which is actually the one which side three still manages to have an eight minute version of Strange Kind of Woman and a nine minute version of Lazy. It also has a live version of Never Before, though. And as far as I know, this is the only one on a record that was an official release anyway. I could do without Lucille. We have a version of Space Truck and it's even longer than what's on uh, Made in Japan. And it also has a 20-minute version of Ring That Neck and another one of Mandrake Root. Those are both mostly long sort of instrumental jams, you know, long middle sections. I mean, Ring That Neck is entirely instrumental. Mandrake Root is, you know, lots of long sort of instrumental sections in the middle. But, um, you know, when I was at my peak with this band, I played this record a lot. I really did. And I appreciated having sort of the alternate takes, you know what I mean? Because... You know, they're like the Made in Japan outtakes and that sort of thing, but it's still kind of the same setting and the same vibe, you know, the same couple performances. This is, what is it, it says, uh, it's from 1970 and 1972, so there you go, that's why I had some of that early stuff on there. But, um, this one, it feels like, is more of a document of them sort of finding their way into what Made in Japan was, you know what I mean? And for that, it's a really cool record, so... This is a gatefold version, which of course I went out of my way for. I think the American version uh, didn't have a gatefold. It was still a double, but it just had with one. And it's fucking long. This is one of those, I remember when I was a kid, it pissed me off. Because you had to tape it onto two 60-minute tapes. It wouldn't just fit on a 90 like Made in Japan would. Okay, so this is the one I'm kind of excited about talking about here. Um, yeah, the last concert in Japan. 
Now, I actually just bought this because I wanted to hear another Deep Purple Live album when I was a kid. And I was fucking rip shit. And now I kind of love it. And it's both for the same reason. Because this is not just Deep Purple. This is the worst live record I've ever heard. Okay, bar none. And being a connoisseur of all things shitty, I really kind of tip my got to tip my hat to this. I actually bought this just a few years ago. I was living in uh, South Carolina already. I just realized I've been here 10 years now. So it's been less than that. But as far in terms of my like personal deep purple history, that's a recent acquisition. I mean, I keep saying that, but the, the point is, I hated this record so much. It just pissed me off. And I got rid of it. And I fucking resented the hell out of it. And then, like, years and years went by. And I was like, man, is that thing really as bad as I remember it being? And, uh, yeah, it's fucking terrible, dude. Like, David Coverdale sounds like shit. Like, Glenn Hughes is kind of doing all the heavy lifting with the vocals. But he sounds like he was doing about as much coke as he actually was. Um, the story with this one is that... Um, Supposedly, um, Tommy Boland had been doing a bunch of heroin, like, right before, and he, like, slept on his, uh, let me think, his left arm or something. So, like, he was so fucking blotto that, like, he couldn't really move his left hand well enough to, like, make guitar chords. So he really, to all intents and purposes, he couldn't fucking play, right? So he was just standing there sort of doing this. And you can hear on this record, you can hear John Lord, like, sort of covering for him, like, filling in all these sections, like, on the organ. So this comes off as a really organ-heavy record, but I think it's because Tommy Bowen was, like, literally too fucking drug-addled to play. Like, literally. You know, it's one of those things that you hear a lot about, but you don't get to hear on record very often, you know? Fucking Smoke on the Water. If you, like, hate the song Smoke on the Water because you've heard it too many times and you just want to, like, blow all that out of your system and just, like, revel in your hatred for it, this is the version to listen to, man. Because it is so fucking bad. It's such an embarrassment. I remember why I bought it when I was a kid because it had a live version of Woman from Tokyo and I wanted to hear that. It also has a fucking version of Wild Dog, but I guess it's a Tommy Bolin solo song. It sucks. Maybe it's good on the record, but on here it sucks. On here, everything sucks, man. Yeah, this is really, this is like an achievement. Like, to make a record this bad is just like really, um, maybe that's why Martin Birch engineered it, because he just wanted to be associated with something. Uh, produced by Deep Purple and Martin Birch, because anyone can make a fucking ACDC record. To make this thing takes a real genius. I mean, this is up there with fucking Contact High with the Gods for bad records. This thing makes uh, In the Sign of Evil by Sodom sound like a pretty decent performance, you know? Yeah. I'm really at awe. I mean, in a way, that picture of Glenn Hughes sums it up. But only in a way, because that doesn't really convey the badness. I mean, that's the thing. None of them look as bad here as they sound on the record, you know? Like, Tommy Bowen looks pretty cool, you know? David Coverdale looks like he's into it. Yeah, well, looks can be deceiving, man, because that's the worst record ever. This is another comp. It's kind of an interesting one. This is a cool record, the Deep Purple Anthology. If you don't feel like hunting down a lot of the 45s, this has a lot of the stuff on it that you're going to want, okay? So you're probably not going to need side four, because it's mostly stuff that's on albums, but like grab splatters and instrumental that isn't on anything else. It has a studio version of Black Knight. If you don't want to track down that 45, you can get that on here. Um, has When a Blind Man Cries, which I guess Ian Gillen really likes, but I think it's kind of not a great song. Freedom's okay. You know, it's um not really an essential record, but if you're as big a fan as I am, it's worth keeping around. It has some Mark I shit like Emeretta that you didn't really see on other stuff too, but you know, you also have to sit through Hush if you're going to listen to that, so... You know, not a tremendous achievement, but, um... As Deep Purple compilations go, this one has more reason to keep it around than uh, most of them. Not as much reason as Powerhouse, which is, like, genuinely interesting. But more reason than a lot of things. Alright, I went from one of the worst to one of the best. I have long said 
and do not feel that I have been disproven in saying that this is the best comeback record ever made. This doesn't just sound like Deep Purple coming back, because this record sounds really 80s, okay? That's a big caveat right off the bat. Compared with the 70s shit, it's not the 70s anymore come 1984. You know what's funny is uh, these are like old guys, or at least they were, it seemed like such old guys at the time when this came out, relatively speaking. I just realized a few days ago that I'm like 10 years older than uh, Ian Gillen was when he sang on this thing. Great record. Every song is great. I'll tell you, the big songs, Knocking at Your Back Door and Perfect Strangers, I've heard those probably a thousand times each, and I'm still not tired of it, man. That fucking drum intro on the... Actually, the bass intro, and then the drum intro on Knocking at Your Back Door still give me chills, man. It's fucking great shit, man. And there's a darkness to this record. You know what I mean? It's not like this sort of jubilant return, like, oh, yay, you know, we're back together again after all this time. There's a real darkness to it that's almost more than what's on the earlier records, although it's a different kind of darkness, so that's a little bit hard to compare, you know? You know, some of the lyrics sound a little bit silly, like on Nobody's Home, but that doesn't take away from it, you know what I mean? Wasted Sunsets is kind of ballad -y, but it still fits right in, man. Seriously, this is a fantastic record from start to finish. It's almost more... It's, it, it's, it's almost like the next step in the evolution of Deep Purple, you know what I mean? Like, in the way that you would hope it would be. Which, you could be disappointed by if what you were looking for was a return to form, you know what I mean? If you're looking for Deep Purple and Rock Part 2. Because this is not that. But this is its own thing, and it's even better than that. Well, I shouldn't say better than that would have been, because who the fuck knows, right? So fucking counterfactuals. But it's an awesome record, man, and one to not snooze on. Probably, this is better than the best records by a lot of bands out there. And that brings us to this one. So I said this one sounds really 80s. And you kind of have them kind of looking cool on the back there. Fucking John Lord always looks pretty dank, but you know what I'm saying. Well, on this one, they're kind of starting to look a little old and a little more tired, and it kind of sounds that way, too. I actually really like the songs on it, and a way this record is more of a logical um, follow-up to where they left things in the 70s. You know what I mean? If you followed up, left it at Who Do We Think We Are, this record should almost have been the one that came next after that, because... I mean, I think it's better than Who Do We Think We Are, but it sounds very dated in its production. You know, I mean, the art style is super dated, and there, this, this record kind of has a special place in my heart, because this is the tour that I saw them on. It was the very first show I ever went to. Opening act was Bad Company. I saw them in Frankfurt, actually, so... If Jurgen's watching, if you saw them in Frankfurt in February of 1987, we were at the same show, just like we were at that same Ray Death show. But, um... This just is missing something that Deep per that Perfect Strangers has, and Perfect Strangers doesn't, ha doesn't just have it, but it's so perfectly refined that you really feel its absence on this record. You know what I mean? Whatever that it is... It's just kind of missing. They kind of sound like they're getting ready to break up again. Which, of course, they were, you know? And that's not how I heard it at the time, but that's definitely how it sounds now in retrospect, you know? And there are good songs on here, man. I Can Handle Bad Attitude, The Unwritten Law. I remember loving that live. Hard Loving Woman. Call of the Wild is really kind of a cornball pop tune, but I can handle that, man. Spanish Archer sounds sort of corny. Mitzi Dupree is kind of a little cringy, but it's really not a bad record, but do I ever reach for this? I mean, not more than once a year, man. Whereas Perfect Strangers, I can pull out all the time and keep enjoying it, you know? So this is really the end. I actually just recently learned that this lineup got together again briefly in like 93 or something like that. I actually didn't even know that, so that kind of goes to show how far off my radar they were by that point, but you know, when you're that age, five years is a long time, you know? The difference between 15 and 20 is a lot bigger than the difference between 45 and 50, you know? So 
So, um, yeah, so I have some kind of warm feelings about that record, but it's not really one I can recommend with much enthusiasm, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's probably some better than some of these 80s Blue Oyster Cult records that I've been sitting around listening to the hell out of, though. Like, uh, well, you know something, I'll save that, because I'm going to do a Blue Oyster Cult video before it's too, too long, and, uh, this is probably enough. One little bonus record, though, because I have one left, another one I found locally, is an original Might Just Take Your Life 45. And let me show the back of this thing, too, with a little ad. Heisse Musik von EMI. Maybe they said AME, but I would have said EMI. With Susie Quattro, because, you know, if you like Burn, then you're going to like, you're going to need your little 48 crash and your Cockney Rebel there, too, right? It doesn't even matter. These things are just so fucking cool. You know what's funny? That it's auch als MC erhältlich. So, with those words of wisdom, auch als MC erhältlich, I haven't spoken German in a while. It just means you can get it on tape. And it's also available on cassette. Um, that's what I've got for today. So thanks for watching. One of my favorite bands ever. We just wrapped it up. See you soon.